Hi there. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you very much for your long and uh, comprehensive uh, analysis of my video. I really appreciated you taking the time to watch it and to invest so much time in responding to me. Uh, I most certainly don't take any offence at your um, courteous disagreement of any of my points and I found it thoroughly entertaining to watch so thank you very much and in the same uh, in the same tone as you made your video uh, please accept this response video so uh, I'm, I'm not as good as you at um, just talking to the camera so I've actually prepared a, a written response so I hope that uh, I hope that it will come over okay uh, as I read off these off these sheets of paper so so first of all, I've got to take a couple of issues with what has just been said. Um, the wording of that wearing the backpack was making him a target for the bullies um, frames everything in terms of the victim's responsibility. Now, I know this is not what you're intending, um, but it's one of the things that's crept into our culture whereby we, um, just in simply the way we talk about it, is we remove the bullies from it. So a more accurate way would have been saying that banned him because the bullies were targeting him for his wearing of the backpack. This is why I script my pieces. It's hard enough to navigate the morass of politically correct language with forethought, let alone off the top of my head. In one sense, one can argue that the fact that my framing is what comes to mind is precisely the point that you are making. But I really think that it's a matter of semantics, and the end result is still the same. I certainly agree that had I framed it as you did, it would have more accurately depicted what was happening. However, however, nobody who framed this as I did would in any way think that his victimhood was primarily Grayson's fault. The inclusion of the word bully clearly indicates where the blame lies. Now, I actually agree with you that this is very similar to the issue of female rape. I, it, it's interesting you talk about female rape um, and not rape in general, um, because the suggestion always is that whenever a man is raped, nobody ever asks what the man was wearing or whether that was a factor. Um, nobody ever asks what um, the man did to possibly make himself a, a target of it. Um, and I think that actually is an important point here. Now, it might sound like nitpicking, um, but the way we talk about these issues actually shows the way that we think about it and the way that these issues are thought of in society in general. And so the fact that we frequently will think about what was the woman doing when she was when she was raped and prior, just prior to it, um, but we never ask the same question of male rapes, um, is telling about the way that we do see things differently based on gender. Um, and is a hint that perhaps we're not thinking about it clear, entirely clearly. Um, other than that, I think it's absolutely right, is that we're talking about people being victimised and whether or not it's reasonable to ask questions about what the victim is doing um, to perhaps um, play a part in that. It's not nitpicking of you to ask what the man was doing. The reason I chose female rape is because rape is usually framed from a female perspective when it comes to victim blaming. If I can generalise female rape into two broad categories, date rape and non-date rape. In date rape, the primary motivation appears to be sexual gratification, whereas with non-date rape, other dynamics such as power, control, paraphilias and childhood emotional issues enter into things. Male rape has barely entered the public consciousness, and it seems that often males are simply seen as a hole to penetrate in the case of prison rape, rather than an object to be desired. The risk factor to the rapist in male rape would seem to be considerably higher due to the closer equality in strength. So this does make me wonder if the psychologies of male rape are possibly different to those of female rape. Male prostitutes and street people are probably one of the higher risk groups outside the prison population and it is clearly their activities that puts them at risk. Just yesterday I was watching a true crime documentary in which an investigator noted that a murder victim's actions had put her at greater risk. Um, stranger murders are very rare, so the idea that somebody would be raped and killed on the street is actually very rare where I work, um, and also that rarely did the victim's behaviour play a big role in it. That is, it was much more the uh, offender's predisposition, and the victims were generally fairly random. And so even if you could probably have convinced every single woman 
not to be drunk and alone at night, um, you may well not be preventing many murders. I agree with you 100% in the case of stranger murder, the least common type, that victims are fairly random and are selected by availability and by similarity to a type that has already been idealised by the rapist. This can be used to make my case. If you don't make yourself available, then you are not there for selection. This is the only claim that I make on the issue. Had this girl not been drunk and walking home at that time, she would not have been the one to get raped. That someone else may well have been is beside the issue. I'm talking about personal responsibility, not responsibility for the whole human race. Furthermore, as someone versed in criminology, you will be only too aware that many stranger rapes, abductions and murders are crimes of opportunity, not meticulous planning. Indeed, when rapists do show planning, it elevates them into a rare and dangerous classification. The issue is not whether Grayson has the right to wear a My Little Pony backpack to school, but whether it's prudent for him to do so. This is essentially the crux of the argument presented in the video. The idea that you can have the right to do something, but simultaneously that it's not a good idea to do so for pragmatic reasons. And in the same case, we'd say that is it still meaningful to say that that child has the right to wear that backpack if the practicalities are that they can't? And I think actually when we boil it down to it, if you think about it, that when you are under threat of coercion, whether it's physical violence in you know, physical bullying or emotional bullying, that does actually limit your rights. And so to say that, yes, we accept that this child has the right to wear the backpack, but pragmatically he shouldn't, you are actually saying that, I believe, that in practice he doesn't have the right to wear it, not the absolute right. I mean, he still has the right, but it's not a clear-cut right that he would have otherwise if he could do so without harassment. So I think we need to be careful about trying to say, yes, he has the right, but he shouldn't do it, because actually what that is doing is undermining his clear right. You make an excellent point about Grayson's right, in inverted commas, to wear a backpack, versus the reality of his situation, where peer pressure coerces him not to wear it. I completely agree with your analysis, but not your conclusion. Indeed, my recent video, Why You Don't Have Freedom of Speech and Probably Never Will, addressed this very issue. The fact that people choose not to take up rights available to them due to social disapproval is one of the defining characteristics between the unwaveringly principled, who will argue their position in spite of public opinion, and the majority who will surrender to peer pressure. Let's get one thing straight right away. Schools are entitled to set and enforce whatever dress code they like. Now, I don't want to get your argument wrong here, um, so I just want to clarify. I agree with you to the point that schools should have a right to uh, regulate what, their what the students wear at school to some extent. Um, I don't agree if you literally meant that they have the right to enforce any dress code or uniform that they see as fit. Um, I mean, the obvious absurd example is a dress code of complete nudity. Um, I believe that, obviously, the dress codes that they can, that they should be allowed to enforce um, really should be limited to within some kind of reasonable bounds and based on evidence. So when they say, well, we're going to ban this because it's offensive, there should be actually be some good evidence behind that that it is actually offensive and some reasoning. So if you're going to ban something for you know, offensiveness, that's a good reason. If you're going to ban something because uh, disruptive, that's a less good reason. On the issue of school dress codes, clearly I'm not suggesting that schools can enforce a dress code of, say, leather chaps with the bottoms cut out and pink cowboy hats. I was merely highlighting that, within reasonable boundaries and for the purpose of academic harmony or social equality, schools should be able to place some restrictions upon clothing. In my school, for instance, everyone had to wear a uniform, the idea being that we had a more professional attitude to schoolwork and the uniform masked income inequality. You argue that banning clothing in schools because it's disruptive is a worse reason than banning clothes for being offensive. You agree that there should be some restrictions upon accepted clothing, racist or homophobic for example, but surely you can see that if you start to open the door to, to precisely which political or ideological statements are acceptable, you immediately turn every item of clothing into a negotiation. I generally agree with you here that um 
school should certainly seek to minimise the disruption to classes, um, etc., etc., and should be reducing homophobia, etc., etc. But I also think that this is a fairly complex issue and one I don't have a good answer to. And I think we should always be careful about abridging the free speech of any person just because it's offensive. You note that one should be cautious of abridging free speech merely because it's offensive. And of course, you're correct. However, children are a special case. Children are not permitted to curse at school or home. Everybody is fully comfortable with the idea of curtailing the free speech of those they perceive as lacking the maturity to use it properly. The boy was being bullied as a direct reaction to the clothing he was wearing. Uh, what you've just said is completely wrong. The, this child was not bullied in direct reaction to the backpack he was wearing. That is suggesting that the bullies had simply no... It was like almost a reflex in them to bully the child as a result of his backpack wearing and that simply removing the backpack would remove the bullying. Uh, this is almost certainly not the case. Now I don't know the case in much detail but I do know something about bullying and I do know a lot about human behaviour and to suggest that the backpack was the sole and main cause um, is to ignore everything that we know about bullying. Now. I think maybe what you were saying was you were sort of overstating the case there for the sort of to make a point, um, but let's bear in mind that those bullies bullied that kid because he was different, and whether he wore a backpack or not, he was almost certainly going to be different anyway. And whether he wore a backpack or not, those bullies would almost certainly have bullied someone. So let's not suggest that the problem of bullying is about removing of this backpack. Um, this back, this one issue is bigger than just simply one kid with a backpack. And the issue in that school, I would be prepared to bet money, is more than just one kid wearing a backpack. I doubt if you remove that backpack, suddenly there will be no bullying, as was suggested by that statement. Um, let's be clear here. Those bullies bullied for a number of reasons. They have their own motivations and drives. They have their own background. They have their own family life, all of which will be a driver in this. And exactly who they select and exactly the manner in which they bully will almost certainly have something to do with the backpack. But the fact that they're bullying, and the number of bullies, and the extent of bullying in that school has very, very little to do with one child's decision to wear that backpack. Whilst you're correct in everything you say, I feel that you are again misrepresenting my position. For the purpose of this video, I'm not addressing the broader issue of bullying. I'm merely looking at the personal level of how a single person can remove him or herself from the bully or rapist field of interest. You make a very astute observation that this boy is different and that by his very nature he is more likely to be a target of those using any difference as a motivation for bullying. Grayson does seem like a wonderful gentle lad with, dare I say it, less interest in being macho than other boys his age. This does raise the issue that if Grayson complies with the school's bans on, on his backpack and then they bully him for his hairstyle, then what? Should he shave his head or do his best to conform to every single schoolyard norm? And if that's still not enough? Okay, so there's two issues here. Firstly, there's the practicality. So yes, schools are underfunded. Um, staff in schools aren't well trained to deal with bullying, etc., etc. And I'm not sure how true this is in all jurisdictions, but, you know, I'll accept that. Um, the answer there is not simply to turn around and go, well, there's nothing we can do. Um, the answer there is to push for better training, for more funding, etc, etc. You suggest that one solution to bullying is to push for better school funding and training. This hits at the heart of the educational dichotomy, that society values obedient, well-educated young adults, yet is unwilling to pay for it. Every responsible parent ever has argued that schools are underfunded and teachers are under underappreciated and underpaid. But even with superb funding, this problem would not evaporate. Bullying is endemic in human nature. The hidden premise here is that the way to deal with bullying is to stop the, um, the discrete incidents of bullying. It's the same in the rape case. The argument there is that the way to prevent rape is through preventing the discrete rape occurrences. Um, whereas actually what we know is the most, especially in the case of bullying, that the most effective ways that a school can do to prevent bullying in general and bullying in particular actually, is a broader school-based systemic approach to bullying. This involves educating the students, this involves um, having certain policies and practices in place so that the, um, the, the issues that give rise to bullying can be addressed before they actually result in bullying. Um, 
these kind of supportive stuff at school levels actually works really well to reduce the level of bullying. Will it ever eliminate it? No. Kids bully. Um, that's part of the growing up process and developmental stuff is to identify out groups and people who are different and to mock them. Um, but it is much easier to deal with those incidents if you've re already reduced it to the point where there is a general school culture that such things are unacceptable. Um, for example, if I happen to be an educator in this school, one thing I might think about doing is having a My Little Pony backpack myself. Why? That seems ridiculous. No, actually, having the staff publicly and clearly supporting the victim actually sends a strong message to all of the kids. Now, you might think that would get the, the victim picked on, and maybe in the short term that kind of thing. So you might need to be a bit careful. But generally speaking, a strong support from the staff for the victim actually goes a long way to reducing these kind of bullying. I wholeheartedly agree with everything you said about the broader picture of bully prevention. Creating an anti-bullying culture is clearly desirable, and I applaud the specific methodologies that you highlight. The principal wearing a My Little Pony backpack may help, or it may get Grayson beaten up for having the same backpack as the principal. As you pointed out, this specific justification is often irrelevant to the bullies. However, I must again reiterate that you are dealing in generalities, whilst I am talking about specifics. I am talking about what will help this boy right now, not after a six-month campaign to make bullying uncool and empower those who are different. Note, there's a few issues here. So, when you say the school took the prosaic approach, what that actually meant is they took the approach that was easiest for them, i.e. the approach that required the least effort from the school. Now, given their budgetary constraints, etc., etc., I can understand why they did that, but it doesn't make it the right approach. Okay? Um, this is typically what happens in these situations. So the school made an the, took the decision to ban the, back the child from wearing the backpack because that was easiest for them. Um, interestingly also, um, it doesn't actually, wouldn't actually reduce the rate of bullying in the school overall. Um, this suggests that the school it was not itself interested in reducing bullying per se. They were just interested in reducing the visibility of such bullying. And in fact, the actions of the school to take out the actions against the victim, i.e. to make the victim stop doing something, can be seen as tacitly encouraging the bullies. That is, they get away with it. Now, any school where bullies can feel like they're getting away with it is one where more bullying is likely to occur, just simply by operant conditioning. No, not the approach that was the easiest, but the approach most likely to yield immediate results for Grayson. Nobody suggested that the school should not also implement anti-bullying policies or that they did not or should not pursue the specific bullies in addition to this action. Respectfully, you are reading an awful lot into my words and their actions that cannot possibly be known by the information provided. Now the second thing is there's a, video, there's a little section of the video there about John Short the missionary. So the idea of victim blaming, okay, let, let's step back here, let's think about this John Short guy. He's a missionary, he went to, South, he went to North Korea, um, even though everybody knew, and probably him, that he'd get locked up in North Korea and probably expelled and possibly even tortured, I don't know what they do there. Is that victim blaming to say he shouldn't have gone there? Now, the answer is, it's victim blaming whenever you're suggesting that his punishment fitted his crime when it's patently clear it didn't. That's what the victim blaming is. So what was his crime? His crime was to illegally enter North Korea, right? Now, if you're suggesting that that, was, that deserved torture, then yes, that's victim blaming. If you're saying that it didn't deserve torture, but that he should have foreseen it, sure, I'll accept that, not victim blaming. But you have to be clear to say that he did not deserve to be, say, tortured. He did deserve to be locked up. That's what we do with people who illegally enter our country. And he did deserve to be expelled. That's what we do when people illegally enter our country. I'll accept that. Um, let's look at the, the idea of rape and the guy with the backpack. So, what offence has this child committed? He has worn a backpack that was not socially acceptable. He has behaved in a non-socially acceptable manner. What was the punishment? Bullying. If you are to suggest that somehow he should modify his behaviour, that is victim blaming. Now, I know you're upset. Some of you will be upset and defensive. Some of you will be saying, oh, bullshit, whatever. Um, that is literally what is meant by victim blaming, is you're suggesting that the victim is responsible for the punishment they received. 
That is, because they knew that they were going to get that punishment, they are responsible for it. Okay? Let's take this to a little bit more an extreme example. Let's say you have a father who is an alcoholic and you are a young child. And your father tells you that if you are bad, he will belt you with his belt. You as a child, you behave poorly. Let's say you cry. He belts you with the belt. Is it victim blaming to say that the child shouldn't have cried? Yes, it is. It is absolutely victim blaming. That child had the right to cry. That is what children do. This child has the right to wear his backpack. That is what he does. Any other suggestion, as I've previously said, erodes the idea that he has the absolute right to wear it and is in fact victim blaming. This is the same with rape victims. When we say that they, sh that they maybe should think about what they're wearing because that was a contributing factor, we are victim blaming. We are saying that some portion of the responsibility for their rape falls to them. That's essentially what we're saying. Here's, here's the responsibility. So we're saying, I don't know, 99% of the responsibility is the rapist's. But 1% is yours because you wore something that made that rapist choose you. Made that rapist. See, again, I'm framing it in terms of the victim making the rapist. Um, that is victim blaming. Now, it's not the worst victim blaming. The worst victim blaming is we say the rapist had no choice but to rape you and it was entirely your fault for being a, um, a slut. Now, this is actually interesting, the kind of thing the Catholic Church was saying about 40 years ago about altar boys. They were saying the altar boys seduced the priests. That's the worst kind of victim blaming. But just because it's not the worst kind doesn't mean it is a kind of victim blaming. So it's down the spectrum from that. I accept that. Um, but to suggest that any part of the responsibility for the rape was the victims is, by definition, victim blaming. I hope that explains that case. Now you might want to say, ah, oh, but it's not blaming. I'm not blaming the victim. Well, you are saying the victim was responsible for it. And basically we're playing semantics about whether you are comfortable using the word responsible or blaming. Um, and you know, if you look at the dictionary definition, there's not a lot of distinction apart from the connotations of um, condemnation in blame rather than in responsibility. So if you want to say it's victim responsibility, yeah, okay, I can buy that. Your definition of victim blaming was well considered, but I disagree with it. You suggest initially that victim blaming is about the proportionality of a response to the victim's actions. Victim blaming says nothing about that. In blaming a raped woman for her short skirt, even victim blamers do not say that the rape was the proportional response to showing too much skin. Victim blaming is about inappropriately assigning a culpability for the result. The fact that the victim knowingly brought their attacker's actions upon themselves. In other words, that it is their fault that the attack occurred. A woman walking home at night drunk could have been more careful, but she is not responsible for the existence of rapists. I do not blame her for being raped. I do blame her for being careless. The two are not contingent. There is a clear difference between responsibility for the situation in which the other person's actions occurred and the actions that occurred. Rape is both illegal and immoral. Rape is both illegal and immoral. The only person who has any responsibility for a rape is the rapist. Being in an excessively rapeable situation is to some extent the responsibility of the victim. Again, I reiterate that this in no way justifies rape nor implies that rape is the automatic and natural consequence of being at a particular place or dressing in a particular way. I merely suggest that when one acts like prey, one cannot be totally surprised when any predators in the area start hunting you. The missionary I cited did knowingly instigate the situation whereby he was imprisoned in North Korea. And whilst he was the victim of unreasonable laws, I absolutely blame him for knowingly choosing to place himself in that position. It was the equivalent of a woman walking naked into a bar wearing a sign saying, have sex with me, then complaining when people did so. Taking the case back to Grayson, probably in his innocent mind he didn't foresee the results of wearing that backpack to school. I don't in any way blame him for wearing it, and if he was strong enough to withstand the consequences of doing so, I'd say, go ahead, keep wearing it. That's clearly not the case. I blame his mother for allowing him to get into that situation, and I blame the bullies for bullying him. Grayson, bless him, has no culpability in this situation. So you've just said something that is actually commonly said in these situations when talking about these issues and is actually not true. So you said that 
society teaches men not to rape. And that is false. How is that possible, you say? Well, society tell, gives men the message of do not rape. Okay? That doesn't teach men not to rape. So it's a different thing. Imagine I told you to I told a child to ride a bike, but I didn't teach a child how to ride the bike. That's what society is doing. It's akin to don't do drugs. So simply sending the message of don't do drugs is not teaching a child not to do drugs. It's, teach, it's telling a child not to do drugs. And that's the same with rape. So we tell boys don't rape, but we don't teach them how not to. What's the difference? Well, there was actually some interesting research that came out of the UK where they took statements from rapists about why um, they'd rape their victims and how they justified it to themselves and various beliefs that they had around this. And then they also took some statements from lads magazines, I think they're called, um, like Zoo or something like that, and they presented them to test subjects. And members of the general public essentially could not reliably tell the difference. That is, what these men who had raped people were saying were indistinguishable from the statements in these lads magazines. So when you say that we taught these we told these kids not to rape, these boys who'd then grown into these rapist men not to rape. Yeah, we told them that. But also in our society, we had sent them messages that were pro-rape. Not messages that said, go and rape, but messages that had supported the rape behavior. So we know in human psychology that usually any behavior that we have, a complex behavior like, like raping somebody, um, is supported by a number of beliefs. And now these beliefs are not directly rape is okay, but they are but they are beliefs around that kind of thing, so that, you know, if a woman is dressed in a provocative manner, that means that she is sexually available. Um, some women say no, but really mean yes, and will change their mind if you keep pushing. Um, these are the kind of beliefs that rapists hold, and they don't just get them from some crazy place in the sky, they come from things like men's magazines. Okay, I completely concede your point here. You draw a clear distinction between teaching that rape is bad, and even if you're both naked and she says no, if you persist, that's rape. I agree that this is a valuable lesson. Whilst we're teaching it, we should also be teaching the girls, don't get naked or play sex games with boys unless you want to have sex, because that's like lighting a fire that you may not be able to put out. And, don't go to parties and get so drunk that you cannot control what is done to you. You make a number of keen observations about the messages that society gives that creates a rape culture. I very much agree that these messages are sent in all areas from social culture to the media to movies and TV. The jury is still apparently out on whether or not these messages do contribute to the rape culture. The very people who claim they do will be the first to howl if you suggest that violence in movies or computer games could possibly contribute to a culture of violence. Personally, based upon logic, personal experience and the way that I observe my own thought patterns being affected by some areas of popular culture, I tend to side with you on this issue. However, I must add that women participate in this culture as enthusiastically as men, and then complain when their sisters are victims of the very environment that they willingly chose to create. I really do see this as akin to setting your house on fire for the lulls, then moaning when you get third degree burns. I realise that this will be an unpopular opinion, but if a woman dresses in a manner specifically designed to sexualise her, emphasising breasts, buttocks and vagina, then acts in a manner that all society recognises as a sexual invitation, flirting, rubbing, strong eye contact, etc., then she cannot be surprised if she arouses a few men. Does this justify rape? No, of course not, but I have as much sympathy for a woman who behaves like this and expects to walk away without consequences as I do for a woman who does fire juggling in her living room and accidentally sets a place on fire. To a lesser extent, they also get the message that whenever there is a story about how a victim had been um, walking alone and drunk and had been raped or murdered, to a lesser extent, rapists and murderers are hearing these stories before they commit their offence. And they are getting the message to some extent, that there is some responsibility on the victim. And that's why feminists are so particularly outraged when well-meaning people are willing to repeat that idea. Even if society was unequivocally supportive of whatever actions a rape victim participated in prior to her rape, many rapists would still try to justify the rape to themselves. 
Because unless they are true psychopaths, they still feel some empathy for the mores of society. They don't use society's victim blaming as fuel for their justifications. They are often acting out fantasies or surrendering to compulsions that bear absolutely no resemblance to the reality of the situation. Even Rebecca Watson, in her refutation of Thunderfoot's video, when citing the reasons given by rapists, acknowledged that the reasons for rapists choosing their victims had everything to do with the persona that the rapist projected onto their victims. She was a slut, she was asking for it, and so on. These projections may be fuelled by the pre-rape activity, demeanour or dress of the victim. Again, just to be clear, I'm not saying that this means that the victims were culpable for the rape. Um, because it reinforces those beliefs that we know. Now, none of those beliefs absolutely lead to, because that's not the way that human psychology works, but those beliefs support those kind of behaviours. And if you accumulate enough of those beliefs and you find yourself in a situation where there's an opportunity and you've got other sort of dispositional things, then the rape happens. And so we know that every little bit of that, if we can remove brick by brick, if we can remove enough bricks, we can reduce the incidence of rape. Now you're right, that no amount of howling and no amount of screaming about education, etc, etc, will ever eliminate rape or rapists. But then, that's that fallacy of all or nothing. Um, doesn't mean that we shouldn't reduce it. For a second, let me take your side and agree that victim blaming does contribute towards the likelihood of rape because it enables the rapist to justify his behaviour. There are two further questions that need to be answered. Are we talking about pre-rape justification that enables a rapist to overcome his conscience and carry out the rape, or post-rape justification that the rapist uses to try to explain his actions to a policeman or psychologist after capture? The two are utterly different. Perhaps a rapist needs no justification for rape in his mind. And again, I think that the justification of date rape and non-date rape are utterly different. A date rapist may be motivated by availability or the belief that sex is his right as a result of the relationship he has had with the victim and seems to me to be the result of sexual urges. I agree that in such a situation, prevailing culture, yes means no, she was asking for it, etc., plays a significant role in shaping the attitudes of the young. Indeed, the pages of magazines such as Nuts, FHM, Playboy, Fiesta, etc., are filled with low-level rape fantasies. Non-date rape perhaps comes down to emotional rather than sexual urges and is unlikely to be coloured by any reality except self-preservation and prevailing culture plays virtually no role. And we are pretty sure there is good evidence that rape comes from these dodgy beliefs about women and responsibility for crime etc. And every time somebody repeats those beliefs, they are furthering this rape culture. Now, it's being called rape culture because these are the beliefs that support rape. It's a horrible thing to hear, especially when you don't mean, when you are yourself are completely anti-rape, but you find yourself saying these things. But yeah, every time somebody repeats this idea that women are at least partially responsible, a little bit, um, for their rape, that is actually perpe that is perpetuating some small part of this rape culture. And that's why feminists are against it. Now we come back to politically correct over what is actually beneficial. If we cannot discuss the prosaic reality of the situation, because it also creates a culture of rape apology, then rape is always going to happen at high levels. Do you teach children not to walk through the woods alone at night, or do you simply argue that to do so creates an abduction apologist environment? And all we'll do is try to convince child murderers not to have desires towards kids. There's no other sector of society where the position you're arguing for is considered reasonable. But because this agenda is so dictated by extremist feminists, the wisdom of it is skewed. Aside from points I've already made about why, even though it might be strictly factually correct, it's actually unhelpful for people to push this to talk about this thing in general. Um, part of the reason why people were very are very upset when these things happen is because for a man to talk about what he can do to reduce the incidence of him being raped when really what he's talking about is women being raped actually especially when that man has no qualifications in that area that is particularly galling to people who are at high risk of being raped people who have been raped or people who are or women who are under the threat of rape so although there may be a strict 
logical truth to the things that he was saying, which I'm not sure because I haven't actually watched the video, um, it's still not particularly helpful for men to weigh in on this when they have no real qualifications other than their, their manness. Um, that's particularly galling to a lot of people. And I, you know, you might say that's really hypocritical because I'm jumping in here to say this. Well, actually, no, because I'm making this video for you as a man. So this is a man-to-man -man discussion. Um, I wouldn't dare make a video that was suggesting to rape victims how they should or should not behave. Because you know what? Even if I was right, they are already paying the consequences of their behaviour. Even if I'm right, they're still suffering. And so I wouldn't dare do that because I don't think it would be helpful. Anyway, let's keep going. You yourself raised the issue of male rape. And whilst rape is an issue that primarily affects women, the tactical and moral issues are gender neutral. And as an intelligent man, Thunderfoot has as much right to weigh in as anyone. Your arguments here ring absolutely hollow. After all, when you say that this is galling to a lot of people, you actually mean galling to women. And who are you to decide that? or comment upon it. By your own standards, men cannot express opinions about issues that primarily affect women. It doesn't matter who the target audience is. When you say this, you sound exactly like Ken Ham or William Lane Craig saying that they would not accept evidence that disproved God. If being right is not enough to enable someone to make an argument, especially for someone who believes in empiricism, then in what possible way can two people of non-identical nature have any discussion? To extend your argument, an elderly woman cannot express opinions because she is not part of the rape demographic, or a woman who never leaves the home, or a girl who never gets drunk at parties. Okay, so here's a really good example of what I was talking about before when I was saying that you can't simultaneously say that somebody has an absolute right to do something, but on the other hand they really shouldn't do it. Um, these two things actually contradict each other in, sub in a subtle way. So. I actually agree with you that a black person has the absolute right to walk through a KKK rally and they also have a right to expect not to be the subject of violence. And if you think about the civil rights movement, a big part of the civil rights movement in the US was about the government actually wholeheartedly supporting the rights of their black citizens. Usually it's the federal government against the state governments. So when the state governments refuse to respect the human rights of their black citizens, the federal government stepped in, and a huge number of these, um, the sort of defining moments of the civil rights rallies, of the civil rights movement, was about federal government standing, you know, as their representatives, at often the National Guard, potentially the National Guard or you know, federal um, FBI or something like that, standing shoulder to shoulder with black people to ensure that they could actually exercise these rights. Okay? Now, you are absolutely right when you draw a dichotomy about what is the advice I would give to one particular person in one particular situation versus what the society should be doing in general and the correct course that we should be taking. So I, I think I get your point that in one hand, if you had one person who had this one situation, the advice would be don't do it if you value your life. But on the other hand, my other advice would be like, do it. I will stand right next to you and we will bring the police with us and we will bring the army with us or whoever we need to. We'll bring the full force of the state to ensure that your rights are not infringed because that's what the state needs to stand for in every case. It's not a right if you can't exercise it. It's not a right if you can't exercise it. So yeah, every black person has the right to walk through a public KKK rally and not be molested, and the government should be expected to ensure those rights are respected. And if they don't, we should be hammering on the government to do so. Every single time. I enjoyed your historical overview of the civil rights movement. I was very glad that in this case you recognise the distinction between the generality of a right and the contingency of a specific situation. Again, I concur with your argument about asserting a right, but in so doing, you completely make my point. You recognise that the only prosaic way in which a black man would safely be able to assert his right to walk through a KKK rally is with the support of the army or police. In Grayson's case, his emotions are not similarly fortified and he can't even depend upon physical protection from bullies as he goes about his school day. 
You assert that it's not a right if you can't exercise it due to constraint or fear. I understand your argument, but rights are nothing more than an abstract concept on a piece of paper. They only become actualized when acted upon. There are a million reasons why each of us does not avail himself of the full gamut of rights afforded to us in the Constitution, or, in my case, the European Convention on Human Rights. Does that mean that we no longer have those rights? Of course not. Those rights still legally exist. Now, in the case of this boy, he never... Now, in the case of this boy, he never actually had a legally protected right to wear a specific backpack to school in the first place. But in so much as you could argue that he has freedom of expression, then that right exists. Even if the school eliminated bullying totally, that boy may never want to wear the backpack anywhere again. The amount of trouble it caused, peer pressure, self-consciousness and other motivations may prevent him. But does he still have the right to do so? Yes, of course he does. The fact that he chooses to self-censor is his problem, not the problem of society. The cause of his self-censorship, and again we're back to the distinction between situational culpability versus the way that others abuse that situation, is society's problem. Now I don't want to besmirch you on this one, and I don't want to weigh in trying to defend every defender of this boy because I don't know what their motives are, but when we're confronted with this, I honestly believe the moral response is not to say oh well, but to say, and this needs to change. And so I would hope that some of his supporters, the reason why they've had such outrage in the face of this is because they fervently believe that this needs to change. That the we need to bring as much fairness as we can into the world, acknowledging that we will never get 100%, but the job of civilization is to try and bring as much as possible, and that we should always be striving for more. We know that bullying needs to change. Every school in the Western world is struggling to address this in light of suicides and negative publicity. But again, my video was not addressing the wider issue of bullying or policy towards it. It was addressing the response of the school and the choices made by this boy's mother. I actually disagree with what you've just said. Uh, maybe not with the sentiment that you're trying to get across. Um, I think the right thing for the parent to do is to say to the son, look, What's going to happen if you keep wearing this backpack? Do you understand? Yes. Do you want to keep wearing your backpack? If so, I will stand by you every step of the way. If not, no problems. Your choice. If the child doesn't understand the consequences, explain what the likely consequences are going to be and allow this child to make the choice. Not to say to them, hey, there's a time and a place for everything. No, the time and the place is when that child decides it's that time or that place. I'm pretty sure I know what you're going to get onto, and I'll make more comments after that. Your point here is a valid one, and I don't disagree with your approach, in some circumstances. But the fact that the bullying affected this boy enough for the school to get involved makes me suspect that Grayson is not robust enough to cope with the consequences. Look, I, I do agree with you to some extent here, and I think you're right, we do need to choose our battles carefully. Um, but that doesn't mean that we should shy away from battles. That simply means that we should choose our battles. And in this case, this child should choose his battles. Now, I don't really know a lot about this case, actually, and I'm not going to criticise anybody else's parenting, because I understand that it's such a complex issue that somebody on the outside with barely any knowledge of the actual situation um, can barely ever give any decent advice. But certainly, I can talk from my own perspective. And while you're right, I would try to lead my child in the best way possible, I would also allow big opportunities for failure. Um, failure is not something to be shied away from. Um, and even in the example you give of karate, to some extent, if a child drops out of karate, that may well be a developmental experience for them. And so I would not discourage my child from trying um, because I am not afraid of him failing. Um, I'm not afraid of myself failing. And so, in this case, I would say that I would be much more in favour of the child making their own decision about whether to wear the backpack, and I would support them to the hilt. There's a world of difference between failure and destruction. It's fine to talk in theory about a child's failure and subsequent quitting of something character-shaping, such as karate, as being a potential character-shaper in its own right, but that's taking the concept to abstraction. If we swap karate for school or even life, it becomes clear that there are times and kids who need sheltering from the storms of life whilst they grow thicker skins. 
If this boy becomes so distressed by bullying that he misses his education, or, as has happened endless times, he actually ended his own life, where has been the benefit? His life ruined or ended because of a desire for him to learn a life lesson? There's a time to offer children choices in the issues that affect them, and that time is when they show the maturity to make those decisions wisely and cope with the consequences. Okay, let's not conflate reasonable consequences of free speech with unreasonable consequences. So, if I say that the Prophet Muhammad was a child rapist, what are the reasonable consequences? That my Muslim friends won't like me, that I won't be invited to the mosque, right? These are reasonable consequences for my behaviour. What are unreasonable consequences? That somebody comes around and firebombs my house and I get beheaded, okay? So yes, free speech has consequences, but the role of the government and in society in general is to make sure that all of these consequences are reasonable and to try to eliminate or remove those consequences that are unreasonable. Yeah? I feel that we're having two different discussions here. You keep coming back to the ideal of reasonable behaviour with little or no regard for the reality, whilst I'm focused primarily on the situation on the ground as it were. Your points about reasonableness and proportionality are all completely sound, but they have as much weight in the actual situation as a man trying to convince a lion that a vegetarian lifestyle is healthier whilst the lion is eating him. When someone is being victimised, it's time for action, not esoteric philosophical policy discussions. So here's the thing. We're actually sort of conflating two issues. So there is the general societal issue of how in general should we deal with rights violations? How much pressure should we put on those people whose rights are being violated to adjust their behaviour so that their rights are no longer violated because they're no longer asserting them? And how much pressure should we put on the violators to stop violating other people's rights? And to use my example of how much responsibility did the victim have for being murdered, right? If you're saying that the victim had 1% responsibility for the actions of the murderer, then we should put 1% of our, act, our responsibility, our actions, into trying to persuade people to act in a way that doesn't get them murdered. And we should be spending 99% of our time and effort trying to stop people from murdering. Now, if you look at YouTube, that's not what's happening. Now, I know there are other sections of, you know, um, the police, etc., who are responsible for catching murderers, etc., etc. Um, but when you look at the, s the discourse, when you look at the way that videos on YouTube and the media, etc., presents it, is we don't have a 99% of the time you know, let's look at the, the violator and the perpetrator and how horrible they are and people shouldn't do this and this is the path that led them to this so that you too can get off the path if you're on heading that way. Um, we have simplistic condemnations followed by almost, often it's almost equal time spent on the victim, right? And in this case, I would bet that it's only the little boy who's looked at. I bet he's the people who are bullying him were not given any coverage at all. So we're not following our sort of, let's apportion it to the responsibility apportionment. This is an interesting example. You seem to suggest that the amount of coverage or curative effort allocated to the victim and the victimizer should be proportional to their share of responsibility for the situation. But this may be erroneous. If a 99% effort towards the perpetrator only results in a 1% reduction in the number of victims, but changing the behaviour of the potential victims results in a 50% reduction, then clearly it makes sense to invest more to change the behaviour of the potential victims. However, even this does not tell the whole picture. In the UK, just 1 in 1.5 million children are abducted by strangers and I have agonised over whether it's reasonable to allocate any time in my training schedule to teaching stranger danger and abduction awareness. However, the consequences of abduction are so severe that parents are happy for their children to spend 10% of their entire training time practising anti-abduction defences. I also teach bully prevention, personal empowerment and conflict resolution so that those kids who encounter the more common situations are prepared. Now there's that issue, and the thing that it's getting conflated with is in a particular situation, what do you do? And actually I think in this particular situation, let's say I have a daughter, and let's say she's five, and she wants to go out at night, okay? At five she doesn't know what she's doing, I stop her. Absolutely, there's no argument, there's no discussion, there's no, you know, blah, 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 blah. 
as she gets older, let's say she's 13 and wants to go out, then we have a discussion about possible consequences and we have a discussion about these kind of things. And then w she and her negotiate some kind of um, decision. So it is partially her choice and partially my choice because this is teaching her how to make good decisions in the future, okay? When she's 18, she's an adult. And let's say she tells me that she plans to go out and get absolutely blind drunk and stagger home in skimpy outfit in the wee hours of the morning through a dodgy area of town. What is my response? My response is to make sure that she understands what the possible consequences of these actions are and to offer her any, any support. I may, if she doesn't understand, if she doesn't understand what the possible consequences are, I may attempt to explain to her what the consequences are. In fact, I will, and I will do my best to have her understand it, and then I will offer her my absolute support, and that's it. And these are the basic principles. So, when your child is very young and can't make good decisions, you make the decisions for them. As they get older, you negotiate and you explain to them the consequences so they understand it, and then you allow them to have a negotiated conflict. And when they're adults, they're adults, and it's their choice. I don't in any way disagree with your assessment of how to raise children with the capacity to make good decisions, or at least to take ownership of their bad decisions. But I suspect if your 18 year old planned to stagger home drunk and alone through a dodgy area of town at midnight, that your resolve to allow her to make her own decisions and live with the consequences would be tested to breaking point. In fact, I don't know of a loving parent who would ever just sit back and watch as their adult child behaved in that way. And we don't at all hold them accountable for the actions of other people. At least I don't. So that's where feminists are coming from. Now, I'm sorry that this is so long, and I'm sorry if I've offended you unnecessarily. Um, the idea here also is everything I've just said then about the way that I would approach my child comes from some evidence about parenting. This comes from how to teach children to make good decisions so that they grow up to be adults with you know, good decision-making skills. This is not rock-solid evidence that we would like to have, but there is good evidence in that direction, okay? There really isn't much other evidence out there. So most, so I've tried in this video to talk about things that are evidence-based. I haven't presented all the evidence. Our disagreement on this issue stems from two primary areas. First, you assume that I'm talking about the issue of rape, bullying and responsibility in general. That's probably my fault, because whilst I was only talking about the actions in this specific case, I used generalities to illustrate my argument. Secondly, you seem to be arguing that even though bad things happen, and people can often modify their behaviour to minimise their risk of becoming victims, that actually pointing that out is victim blaming, and is detrimental to the effort of preventing future victims. I think that espousing high-minded ideals about what bad guys should be doing, whilst in reality they are doing something else, whilst the victims continue to mount, is irresponsible and places your aspirations ahead of meaningful action that could reduce the victim count now. There is clearly a need to address the issues of rape and bullying, and there is no reason why programmes of detection, counselling and prevention cannot be embarked upon simultaneously. You make a passionate case that one should stand up against wrongdoing any time one encounters it. But that rings as hollow as telling the USA that they should attack Russia with the same vigour as they attacked Iraq. Principles are fine, but the unwavering and ruthless application of those principles at every opportunity is foolhardy and counterproductive. Whilst I disagree with many of your conclusions, which I feel derive from an inflexible application of standing up for what you believe in, I thank you very much for your comprehensive analysis of my video. I very much enjoyed your response. Hey guys, thanks for watching, hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please take the time to rate and comment, and it would mean a lot to me if you would subscribe. Thank you.